Congressman, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, John. Um, you were a big shot in the White House <laughs> before Barack Obama even had a political career. Then you were his friend coming up in Chicago. Then you were colleagues in the Congress. Now you work for him. Mm -hmm. Talk about how your relationship with him has changed. Um, uh, I work for him. It's a lot different. And uh, in the sense that it's his presidency, it's his agenda. My job is to see it through. I give him, as we were as friends, as well as colleagues, the best advice. I'm not, then I was, you know, a member of Congress. He was the senator. Uh, we worked a lot on a lot of different things, on alternative energy, savings agenda, uh, different, different items. We did lobbying reform together uh, in the sense of reforming the entire uh, lobbying code as it exists. But uh, and in that sense, I gave him uh, advice, but took it or didn't take it. Same exists now, he takes it or not. But I'm responsible, I think, for giving him honest advice, uh, both the good and the bad. But it is his presidency, the way he wants the White House to run, the way he wants to communicate, et cetera. Can't be his friend so much anymore? I don't think I should. I don't, you know, let me say this. Let me try to do the answer this way, okay? Because friendship requires a dual sense of loyalty. And I do feel a sense of his own loyalty. But I ultimately, it's 100% loyalty from me to him. And so I think it's smarter where we are friends and we are friendly, uh, but the type of friendship we had as two colleagues together has to be different because I work for him. It's just natural and it should be. I would expect that. And I would want that as a chief of staff to the President of the United States. Your job as chief of staff in part. In, in the sense of you don't want the friendship to blind what you is the mainstay of the relationship. One of your jobs as chief of staff is to manage all of the people around him. People from Chicago who have long relationships with him. Uh, you've got czars in the White House. You've got cabinet secretaries. <laughs> Talk about how difficult it is to keep order in that process. And I'll give you one example. Uh, you have Tim Geithner as the Treasury Secretary. Larry Summers has held that job. How do you make sure that Larry Summers doesn't interfere, say, with what Tim Geithner wants to do, what the people doing health policy want to do? How do you, how do you ride herd on that? Well, um, two things. Uh, first of all, as I joke in the White House, nobody's a czar. The reason is czars weren't good to my people, so I don't like the title <laughs> anyway. Uh, you're, you're ahead of an effort to coordinate the, both the policy, the politics, the legislation, and the kind of interagency effort, be that on energy or healthcare, which is the two spaces you talked about that we've added. Second, one of the things I'm most uh, proud about in helping the president see through, not most, but proud of, it shouldn't get big recognition. But if you compare it, and as you noted in the first question, then I worked in the uh, uh, President Clinton's White House. Uh, this White House is not, has not experienced or had the kind of generational difference we had in the President Clinton. There was kind of the Young Turks, of which I myself was, and Paul Begala and others, versus what we consider then the adults, not really steeped in politics, et cetera. We didn't have the kind of new Democrats, we don't rather have, the kind of new Democrats versus the traditional split that existed in that White House. We don't have, uh, uh, in this White House, the uh, President versus Vice President staff divisions that have been in other White Houses. I think part of that is, A, the tone and tenor the President of the United States has set and expectations. Uh, the way I have also done that as a Chief of Staff responsible for directing the staff. And then third, I think everybody involved has been involved in some portion of their life in public service. They know the moment in time they're working uh, in this White House. It will be the piece of history that they will always take with them. Every White House is historic, but this is a unique, I mean, we, I think we all would agree that this is an exceptional moment in America's history. It's at a fork in the road. Uh, and given that, the kind of disputes, oh, I wasn't invited to this meeting, oh, that person's got more attention than I, I worked on this, that hasn't happened. And in addition, I mean, I try to always make sure, like, and, um, and the President does, when, uh, like when we passed the Recovery Act, although I spent a lot of time on it, was a lead person, Phil Shalero, Legislative Affairs Director was a lead person. 
uh, Peter Orzak at OMB, Rob Neighbors. And I will tell you this, I, any one of those people, I would take them in any private sector position I've ever been in, in any public sector position. They're outstanding. How about that summers geithner relationship? How is that working? It's working very well. And I mean that. It's working very, very well. We meet every day in my office. We just left the meeting. One of the reasons I'm running a little late is we met at our office. We do it every day going over uh, what, uh, in the sense of the economic plans or what we have uh, going on. And it's going very well. And obviously, uh, do, but the good news is it's not going well because it's, you know, it's just everybody agrees. It's going well because we're having a healthy debate and an agreement on the choices you are making are, they're not, you know, President Kennedy used to say, Governing is not choosing between bad and worse, it's choosing between you know, good and bad, it's between bad and worse. These are tough choices. And you try to weigh the equities, and we're having a healthy debate, and we're not personalizing the healthy debate. That's the good news. One other comparison with the Clinton White House. You worked in a White House with a very strong first lady. In fact, mm -hmm. she tried to fire you at one point. <laughs> Talk about how it's different now with Michelle Obama, who is also a strong first lady. Yeah, I mean, well, every, well, it's like this. Every president brings their own stamp to the presidency. Every first lady brings their own stamp to their position and their role. And, uh, you know, Michelle and the president were friends, obviously, of Amy and myself. And uh, her first and foremost is role she sees as to her family. And, uh, you know, that everything else is a distant second. Um, let's but, talk you know, I mean, you can observe, I mean, everybody can observe that and see that. Um, let's talk about 100 days. Um, clearly, Barack Obama is doing very well in the polls. Mm -hmm. The American people like him. But what would you say to someone who said one accomplishment that you've had is, for reasons that are well understood and that started before you became president, we've gone further down the slippery slope to government having a 50 percent stake in GM, according to the bond offering, likely after the stress test to have a larger stake in major financial institutions. What would you say to the complaint that we're moving more toward a role that government shouldn't play and isn't well equipped to play? Well, I think I would start on the affirmative. Ultimately, uh, what has made the economy dynamic and strong is this both kind of we're a country of rule of law. There's a transparency to it. There's also a, this is, you know, more in the kind of uh, feeling, a entrepreneurial spirit, kind of, and that goes back way in our history. That is what has made America's capitalism the most dynamic economy, uh, its style. It has um, always had generations of I think, um, improvement on its basics. And what do I mean by that? We're in a period of time of defining that relationship between the pr uh, private sector of the economy and the government. The ultimate... And the role of government is getting a lot bigger. But it, it is getting bigger, and that is but a transitional time. It's, it is not a permanent nor a desire. Let me just be clear. It's not a desire of the president that it be permanent. When could it but, be Well, we've got to get back to us. We've got to get to a position both in the financial, you're mainly auto and financial, but back to a position where though you can stand alone and be ongoing operations, it doesn't require either government assistance or guarantees to get that. That's desire. The sooner the better from our perspective. But for the stability of the overall economy, it it, the moment requires that. I think what you define, and if you go back through histories at different stages, A, governments have made at key stages, key investments. I don't want to do, I'll, if I can, I know you want a short answer, but I actually enjoy this answer because it's a philosophical one. Uh, a, regulation in the sense of transparency, accountability, has, in, has grown as the economy gets more complicated. One of the moment problems we've had here at this moment in time is the regulation and the rules of the road did not keep up with dynam dynamism of the economy, specifically in the financial, that has had a ramification. Two, if you look back at history, at every stage in which we've had a major war, there's been a major investment in America to make sure that the sacrifices made would c come home for greatness. Just finished Stephen Ambrose's book on uh, the Civil War, but on the transcontinental investment in the transcontinental and the landmark colleges under Lincoln. Before World War II was over, you had the GI Bill, let alone other types of investment were done. At the height of the Cold War, Eisenhower invested in the interstate highway system, and Kennedy uh, in the challenge puts a man on the moon. 
you could mark that down historically. We are at that moment in time. We have obviously two wars going on, hot, hot wars, one in Iraq and Afghanistan. But the investments in America, in its own economy, be that its physical infrastructure, its human capital, has been denied. And that is also historical. At this moment in time, you make those investments so that America's economy can grow for the next stage. When that Barack is. Obama uh, finishes his first thank you for term. The, thank you for letting me try to get that in in two minutes. When Barack Obama finishes his first term, Will the United States government still have a huge stake in General Motors in major financial institutions? John, if I could predict that, I'd be, you know, sitting in that chair, not here. Uh, the desire, I think, is what's important. It's, the goal is, you know, the president's desire is not to have more of a stake in individual or private companies. It's to stabilize uh, these either industries or companies so they can make this transition to a different place. You've and done. obviously the ideal would be the sooner, as I said, the sooner the better we're out of it. We would like to do it. I think for the overall economy, you have to have uh, uh, ha the banking industry and financial industry turn to the government at that particular time, having spent basically 20 years with a philosophy of shunning government, and I think we all paid a price for any role, well, not some financial. some of those firms want to get out of it, and you don't want them to no, get no, out no. of it now. Uh, they would like, look, as I said, we want to, we don't want to be involved in the business, in the private sector or individual companies. We have to stabilize the markets so they can then go on and prosper on their own. Let me ask you about Wall Street. You know the financial industry well. You made a lot of money in the financial industry. As you advise the president, as you think about it in your own head, uh -huh. how do you separate out the parts of the financial industry that should be honored because they're smart, because they contribute to productivity, because they help the economy, and the parts of the populist argument that there's a lot of self-dealing and corruption and sleaze, how much of that argument do you consider really true? Well, the financial sector has played a, and that's writ large, it's not just the banks in New York. There's private equity is made up of the financial services industry that has played, a, no doubt, parts of it at certain different stages, a key role in the competitiveness of the American economy. It can have, like everything in life, what's good can have excesses that turn into being its weakness rather than its strength. Uh, the financial services industry, which includes insurance companies, includes others, is an important part of America's economy and its growth. That growth, without some sense of the rules of the road, can clearly flip over and become an excess that is, you know, I wouldn't say harmful, but can have a negative uh, role on the economy. You, the, I think the public's, this is analyzing where the public is upset. The public's sense is that over a long period of time, the financial services industry had high reward. They've now had a major impact for their, I don't want to say, uh, mismanagement, for lack of, lack of accounting for the risk that they were taking. They turn to the public sector, that is, i.e., the taxpayers, to bail them out, and yet want no change in any either their business model or their compensation. Before the compensation was a direct result, they said, think of it from the public's perspective, the public, their compensation is a direct result because of their innovation, what they've added to the economy. Yet when there's a downside to that, and then the entire economy has been put at risk because of their failure to a, account for risk, they want none of the changes that we should come from that either in business practice, compensation, or business model. And the public says, you can't, you know, heads I win, tails I lose. And I, 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 I've talked to a number of uh, people in the financial industry, and I say that writ large, not just banks, who understand there's just, there's just not a common sense to that. It's, American people have a fair sense that you get rewarded for success. They're having a little trouble with the reward for having failed. One of your jobs as chief of staff is to help the president figure out when you can declare victory on an issue, even if you don't get everything you want. Two particulars. Can you have a successful outcome on health care if you have not dramatically expanded coverage, if you have a piece of legislation that focuses on cost reduction? And can you have a successful and transformative energy policy without putting a price or a limit on carbon emissions? Uh, the way I'm going to answer that, John, is to go back with what the President said when we were passing the Recovery Act. Don't make the perfect the enemy of the essential. 
And he said that in the Recovery Act at key moments in the negotiation. He made that uh, clear in the, uh, when we were negotiating this budget that I think we're on the doorstep of uh, uh, passing, which will be a note for you as a blue economic blueprint will ha happen in record time with record uh, vote. That said, uh, he has his principles are very clear on health care, controlling costs, so pr you don't have uh, health care costs accelerating at three times on average inflation. On energy, weaning ourselves not only from dependence on foreign oil, but most of all, if we do the energy policy right, it will be the greatest job growth we'll see uh, in our country in a long time. His goals are clear. He's willing to explore different roads to get to those ends. He mentioned in a speech the other day the role of nuclear power and oil drilling. Are those going to be part of a final energy package? The greatest, you're going to stay tuned as we outline it. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you uh, as we do it. But he has said, and you can go point to what he has said, John, in the past, which is you have to have a comprehensive policy uh, and a comprehensive approach. You just can't lean. You have to have enough emphasis on efficiencies. That was de-emphasized, and we've paid a price for that, be that in home appliances, transmission, across the board, we don't, uh, in autos, where we're better on mileage. We are not as effective in our efficiencies as we should. That, there's a lot of savings to be had there. Second, investments in alternative energy. Starting industries and companies that will be dramatic job uh, producers in the future and catapult America back to its natural lead in innovation. And third, there are sources. Uh, you know in Illinois we come from a state that has a, a, a heavier than normal depends, average heavier or greater dependence on nu nuclear than others. He has said in the past nuclear is part of that. He has said um, he doesn't believe drilling is a solution, but he is open to it. What that composition is across the board, you'll see as we draft the legislation. You know the House of Representatives and Congress better than most White House Chiefs of Staff. And you were known when you were successfully leading the Democratic effort to win Congress for saying no to the left where necessary as you were trying to win seats in parts of the country where the left isn't popular. Talk about how you uh, work with leaders on the Hill, Nancy Pelosi in particular, to try to get them e to accept your formulation that the perfect can't be the enemy of the good. Well, I think uh, you got to look at the results. We've passed the largest economic recovery act in uh, American history that helped us on the, on the both, uh, hopefully will help us stabilize the economy and help us produce jobs. Everybody had a vision of what they would like. In the end of the day, we produced uh, what would get the job done. There are things that were not in it that we liked. There were things that were in it and that were strong in the sense of alternative energy, uh, making sure there was reforms in healthcare, make sure that uh, we were training the workforce for the future. Uh, and uh, the speaker, as you, you know, and you're pausing her, I will have a discussion. She is a fundamentally a pragmatic, put points on the board, get wins. I think the question, and I, this always, I get asked, you know, left versus center, et cetera. The question isn't really a philosophical one of left versus center. The question is, are we moving forward or backwards? Republicans and I say think that, that you're giving in to uh, Pelosi and the left by pursuing health care under reconciliation rules that will jam them and limit their role. They say that you're going to war against them. What do you say about that? I just had this joke the other day to the president, which is that reconciliation the rest of America means you come together. Only in Washington doesn't mean you get divided. And the fact is, the president sat in a bipartisan meeting last week and said, provide the ideas. We're, we want your ideas. Second. He started a health care conference, as you remember, at the White House that brought Democrats, Republicans, governors, mayors, doctors, hospitals, law lawyers, consumer groups, nurses, everybody at the table. That's his approach. Contribute your ideas. Come to the table constructive. Don't worry about a process that starts on October 15th. What are you doing on May 15th? What are you doing on June 15th? What are you doing on July 15th? What are you doing on August 15th? What are you doing on September 15th? We have a lot of time. Use that time productively. Don't worry about it. October 15th when reconciliation would or wouldn't happen. You have a lot of time right now to figure out how do we control costs? How do we expand the pool of coverage so we can also control costs? And how do we make sure we have a system in place so America does not have a health care system that's driving businesses, families, and the government out of money? Swine flu. Uh, it was a formative experience for many in Washington to see the crisis response in the case of Katrina, for, and it was very hurtful to President Bush. 
Talk about, as we sit today, what are the risks as you assess them that this will actually become a catastrophe in the United States in which a large number of people will lose their lives, or do you think it's not that big of a deal? Well, well first of all, there's, as you know, the head of the Department of Homeland Security uh, and CDC are responsible for communicating uh, on this. We did a communication on both the Sunday briefing at the White House and also uh, the President spoke to it yesterday at the National Academy of Science and every day I think for the process uh, at one o'clock CDC down the Center of Disease Control in the White uh, down in Atlanta will be speaking and at three o'clock at the Department of Homeland Security will have presentation both by the Director of Homeland Security as well as from the National Security Staff John Brennan. I'm, I think I know John that's a fair question but I, I think this is very sensitive at this moment. I think you have a public health concern, uh, this first and foremost, and also the impacts uh, on the rest of the economy. I think the key thing is those who observe this notice that we're ahead of where we should be in the sense of making sure the public knows you have to, as the President said yesterday, be alert and sensitive. We're not in the, uh, I want to be not technical, I want to be careful though how you use the words. We have to be alert to this. It's not in the sense I think you used or if you didn't, at least I heard, mm -hmm. the sense of a crisis, but what you got to do is take the steps to avoid type of that, that type of crisis. Uh, I read John Barry's book, The Influenza of 1918. It's, I think it's a very uh, good book. I read a number of other books on this. Um, they obviously go in stages, as he makes, as Mr. Barry makes clear in the op-ed today in the New York Times. 1918, you had kind of a spring kind of early warning. It recedes and then it comes back with a force in the fall. The good news, and I think you know this, that one of the first pieces of legislation Senator Obama passed was dealing with the funds at that time for the flu. We have an infrastructure and capacity that I think John Brennan outlined on Sunday at the White House. It sounds Senate. like you think the risks of a, of a full-blown crisis are minimal at this point. I think we got to take certain steps that are necessary, both the federal government, the state and local governments, families, hospitals, etc. You have to do that, and I think the, that will mitigate the potential for exactly that. Two things quickly before I let you go. You're known <laughs> as a volatile guy, a bit of a Roman candle with a temper. What's the angriest you've gotten in the first 100 days? That I had to do this interview right in the middle of everything else I needed to do. Uh, well, you know, first of all, um, as you, you all know, both of us have different images, and we think that we're different than our images. Uh, I don't have a in my view, a volatile temper. What I have is an ability and a desire to drive to a conclusion so I can get the president what he wants. Uh, there are times you're frustrated by other people, I think, uh, in the process who have their own equities at stake in the sense of under aligning those equities. I get, uh, uh, what a, uh, in the sense of angry, uh, I don't think that's the emotion I would describe. I've gotten frustrated and let my frustration be known and remind everybody there's a bottom line and that is the President of the United States and getting what he wants done for the uh, country in the time frame he wants to get it done. How about when you heard about that flyover of the uh, Air Force uh, plane around the Statue of Liberty yesterday that so upset people in New York? Uh, when did you uh, first hear about that? Did you approve it? Uh, and what was your reaction to it after it happened? Uh, I let the individual know that, uh, and I'm going to keep it at that, which is how I manage the White House. Is, it's not a public piece. You'll see it. The individual responsible knows what I think, and uh, that's what's important. And as soon as I found out, I had a discussion with them. You did not approve it before it What was the highest level at which it was approved before it happened? You know, why don't we talk about the economy? Don't worry about that, because I had a conversation with the individual, and I, everybody's responsible for their area. The person responsible, I had the conversation with. But no senior White House official approved that flyover? Uh, no. John? The person responsible in the White House for it is put a statement out saying they took responsibility. That was Caldera? Yeah. And I had a conversation with them immediately when I found out. But that was the highest level that it was approved before? Yes. He, in the statement, as he said yesterday, he takes responsibility. It was his decision. He and I had a, a conversation. The way we run the White House, everybody's accountable for what they're responsible for that happens under their zip code and their address. Right. You a know that a lot of people in New York have a hard time understanding I how understand. that could ever have happened. Sure, I understand. Part of management, having run through a number of places where I've run things, is making sure that people know individual responsibility and accountability. So there's no collective sense so nobody's accountable. 
Lou runs that office. That's why he put the statement out yesterday uh, of res taking responsibility, which I think was a good thing for him to do, because I think one of the things that American people don't see enough from their government is people who step up and say, hey, that was mine. I own that. Thanks so much for talking sure. to us. Appreciate it.